you have your Bible with you, turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Abigail Van Buren once said, cripple him and you have a Sir Walter Scott. Lock him in a prison cell and you have a John Bunyan. Bury him in the snows of Valley Forge and you have a George Washington. Raise him in abject poverty, you have Abraham Lincoln. Blind him, you have a Ray Charles or a Stevie Wonder. Deny her the ability to see, hear, or speak, and you have a Helen Keller. Tell a young boy who loves to sketch and draw that he has no talent. Then fire him from a newspaper for having no ideas, and you have a Walt Disney. Afflict him with periods of depression so severe he cuts off his own ear, and you have a Vincent Van Gogh. Call him a slow learner, retarded, and write him off as uneducatable and you have an Albert Einstein. Let him be born black into a society filled with Jim Crow racial discrimination. And you have a Booker T. Washington, Harriet Tubman, George Washington Carver, and Martin King. Spit on him, humiliate him, then crucify him, and he forgives you, and you have the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these are individuals who escaped the orbit of their Jericho. They escaped the gravity that was making them continually go in circles and they became free to fly. But since you all are still not feeling me like I need you to, can I, can I just go ahead and give you an experiential exegesis of the Jerichos that we all run around? Let me just extrapolate from your experience an explanation for where we find ourselves with Joshua today. Because first off, notice if you will, not all of our Jerichos are visible. There's a, a popular ogan, uh, slogan and ad campaign for PTSD that reminds us that many a soldier, many a policeman, many a fireman or EMT revisits the horrors of the battlefield, the beat, the fire, the dead and dying, long after they come safely home. Many a person stands watch in the dark 3 a.m. hour of the soul because Jericho, their Jericho is not always visible. Then on the other hand, this is number two, not all who have won against the odds are well-known celebrities. That might be your friend, your mother, your sibling, your child, your next door neighbor. <clears throat> Maybe they graduated with you, sat next to you in the, in the class or in the cubicle, and you never knew. I mean, maybe they're in your own home or at your own workplace or, or somewhere on your Facebook feed. Maybe, maybe, maybe they wear skinny jeans and Uggs. <clears throat> maybe they wear business suits and Prada. Maybe they wear, wear Levi's and cowboy boots, or maybe they're sagging and bagging at the grocery store, but you don't know. So third, third, every family has its own heroes and sheroes for whom there is no medal distinguished enough, <coughs> excuse me, to reward them for their contagious courageousness against their Jericho. And I'm sure there would have been many in Joshua's day who would have looked at that motley crew of Israel and, and concluded there was no way, Jose Posible, that they would ever cross Jordan, conquer Jericho, and claim their Canaan. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. Look, Alan, I don't know who told you I was going to be here today. I mean, I tried the 8 a.m. service, thinking nobody was there, but they were. And I'm trying the 9 o'clock service so I can, I can see if I can hide out in the crowd. I mean, one time even came to the 11 o'clock service thinking you'd be too tired by then to notice that I had snuck in the back. And yet here you are sitting in my seat, stirring my Kool-Aid. And if I were honest with you, I would admit, I got people in my life right now, they've already concluded I will never get out of my own way. <coughs> I'm, I'm never going to quit running around the Jericho of my addiction. I'm never going to escape my slavery, never going to amount to anything for God, never going to overcome my past, never going to heal my hurts, never going to achieve God's will, never going to make God's eternal purpose my life mission. So don't let me leave here today till you show me from Scripture how can I stop running around my Jericho and prove to them I can be courageous with a courage that becomes contagious, first to our community, but also to the next generation. I'd be glad to help you out. Give me a minute to unpack our passage. We'll clothe ourselves with this truth, get our healing, and head out of here ready to be contagiously courageous for Christ. Let me take you to our text, Joshua chapter 6, because as we approach Joshua, the children of Israel have to deal with the city 
and the citizens of Jericho. And last week, we looked at the first five verses to get the vision for the victory that we need. But this week, we need to glean from the rest of this chapter because they crossed the chilly waters of Jordan on the way to Canaan, only to be stopped short at Jericho. In the natural, it was impossible. But in the supernatural, it was a divine opportunity that required a, contag- a courageousness that would be contagious. From Joshua to the leaders to the person in the camp. <coughs> so can I just show you today how to claim your Canaan? Anybody want to hear this? Just say, it's just Jericho, Alan. Yes, it is. So first off, notice if you will, you have to recognize the obstacles you must face. Let the whole church say obstacles. James Montgomery Boyce describes how, according to Lieutenant Colonel Ferris Kirkland, a former professor of military science at the University of Pennsylvania, the most exciting lecture he ever heard was on an ancient general's military tactics. And he was a guest lecturer. He wasn't even the regular teacher, but he held the students spellbound as he described that general's strategy. And he, he described a sudden strike into the heart of enemy territory, dividing their forces, and then a campaign in the south and in the north. He described techniques of psychological warfare, the element of speed and surprise and terror. And when he asked the students, who did they think he was describing? Many suggested Alexander the Great or Napoleon or Julius Caesar or Attila the Hun. But at the end of the lecture, after all of the possible names had been exhausted, the teacher revealed the identity of the one whose battle he was describing, and it was Joshua. Before their promised land could be claimed, a wedge had to be driven between the Canaanite kingdoms. And that wedge had to go all the way, thank you, all the way from the Jordan River, all the way from the valley, up to the mountains, between them and the coast. And when, when when you take our Israel trip with us this November, you will see how strategic that geography is. One obstacle that could not be bypassed by any general was Jericho. And and it required a contagious courageousness to overcome because first, this is letter A, you've got to have a courageous, contagious, a contagious courageousness whenever you find a fortified stronghold. Look at verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. God's eternal purpose, according to Ephesians 3, is to glorify himself by Jesus Christ through his body, which is this church. But in order for you to make that your life mission, your Jericho is going to have to be destroyed. Problem is, Jericho is not your ordinary obstacle. Because it's not only fierce, but Satan has fortified it in your nature, in your soul. It is a hold that is satanically strong, demonically defiant, with a wall that is high and an entrance that is barred. And before you can get to that, you've got to go through this. Before you can reach your promise, you've got to deal with your problem. Before you can get strong, you've got to handle your stress. Before you can have your miracle, you've got to mitigate your mess. Somebody knows what it means to go through this before you can reach that. And, and, And you have to have the courage to press on because here's our thesis for today's study. God's providence always plants a blessing in your problem that you do not see and cannot anticipate. Let me open a window on that word. Legend has it there was once a benevolent king, and he had his army place this large, heavy stone on a certain road that all his subjects had to use. And the king hid himself to see what would happen. And nobody stopped to remove the stone. And instead, everybody worked their way around the stone gladly cursing and cussing out the government for not using their taxes to keep that roadway clear. And finally, one poor peasant farmer on his way to town with a load of wheat, he comes and he sees his way is blocked and he stops his cart. He laid down his load. He unyoked his oxen. He put a rope around the stone. And with considerable effort, he managed to move that stone to the side of the road. Turning to leave, he noticed a purse on the ground flattened by that stone. He opened it and found it filled with gold coins and a small note from the king that said, this belongs to the person who rolls away the stone. And I don't see why you're not getting this because Jesus rolled away the stone. Jesus rolled away the stone. 
Jericho belongs to him. The people in Jericho belong to him. And now, by all the merit he won by unblocking our way to God, he gives us grace to enable us to complete God's eternal purpose with our life. You will have obstacles. Don't let them stop you. God has planted a blessing by the finished work of Christ that you do not expect and you cannot earn because it's grace. So before they could control Canaan, they first have to conquer Jericho. But second, for every formidable stronghold, and this is letter B, you also find a faithful strong hand. Look at verse 2. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor, and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. Now rewind to chapter 5, because we saw in verses 13 to 15 of the previous chapter what is called a Christophany, or an Old Testament appearance of the New Testament Christ. And he shows up to remind Joshua that while he is facing a fortified city, he has a faithful companion. And that faithful companion can do what Joshua cannot do. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I have a faithful God. Because when God shows up, God can shore up our declining courage and our fading faith. They were right in the old church when they used to sing, There is a balm in Gilead. Don't be discouraged. Joy comes in the morning. Know that God is nigh. Stand still and look up. God is going to show up. He is standing by. Do I have a witness? God has shown up at your Jericho to lift your head, calm your nerves, open your eyes, heal your injury, encourage your soul. Joshua faced a stronghold, but with a strong hand. And simply put, this is our first point for study. The conquest of your Jericho, the end of your addiction, the escape from your slavery is a divine project and therefore divine pursuit, wherein if you handle the input, God is going to take care of the output. Trust God till the stars fall, and God will take care of the consequences. How many times do you carry a burden that does not really belong to you? You are a thief because you're carrying burdens that really belong to God. You fight battles that have already been won in the finished work of Christ. Success in the Christian life is not through legalistically carrying out our burdens. It is bringing our burdens to the Lord and leaving them there with Him. Why? Because the Bible reveals to us that, that the, the captain who came to Joshua was really the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives you not only the ability to fight your battle, he's already won the war through the cross. Okay, wait. We don't like to apply the cross because while the cross means life for us, it also means life to us. Hello, somebody. Okay, okay. Uh, keep your finger here, but turn to Psalm 55. Let me be kind and rewind. While the cross means death to the flesh... It also means the spiritual life necessary to win the battle. But we don't want to crucify self, so we will not apply the cross. And we just keep running around and running around and running around our Jericho. The city is fortified, but your companion is faithful. You face a stronghold, but you'll always find a strong hand to help you. Can I just prove it to you? Psalm 55, verse 2. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he, let the whole church say he, he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the, suffer the righteous to be moved. Die to self at the cross, so you can get the life of Christ at the cross. Okay, wait, hold it. You missed that. You get his life after your death. After your death, then you get his life. Solomon all around us should have bought Honda. Now, I don't believe speaking in tongues is for today, but if I did, I'd do it right there. I mean, right there is where I would do it. Because secondly, secondly, if you're going to claim your Canaan, then this is number two, you've got to receive the orders you must follow. Let the whole church say orders. 
Now turn to 1 John chapter 5. Keep your finger here in Joshua 6. Turn to 1 John 5 and watch. When Joshua receives his orders for defeating Jericho, I'm sure they seemed ridiculous to him. I mean, they seemed unreasonable and irrational because they were two things that we're going to list here for you. God's word must be obeyed because first, it is specific. Here in Joshua 6, look at verse 4. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets, not, not six and a half, not seven and a quarter, of ram's horns, not, not something else. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, but check this, the people shall ascend. They shall ascend up. Every man straight before him. God made it clear what it would take to be successful. If they wanted to succeed and accomplish their conquest of Canaan, they had to follow God's orders specifically. Now watch, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That is what overcomes our Jericho. That is what defeats the world, the flesh, and the devil. That is God's strategy for success. Okay, watch. We put this on your handout, and I think also on a slide. See, because 1 John 5, 2 is spiritual victory. But Romans 12, 2 talks about being transformed through the renewing of your mind. That's mental victory. John 13, 34 says, love each other as Christ has loved us. That's relational victory. Leviticus 27, 30 says, the first tenth of all your income belongs to God. That will give you financial victory. So, so we've been given specific orders. If we can just trust God enough to try God. And these specific orders had to be obeyed, even though, this is second thing, letter B, they were strange. Matthew Henry says, no trenches were dug, no gun emplacements erected, no battering rams used. Joshua and the children of Israel were about to go to war, but God does not instruct Joshua to put together an arsenal of the finest, latest, most advanced military equipment like tanks, drones, or ballistic missiles. This campaign was not even going to be led by the military leaders alone, but the spiritual leaders of the nation. So the men of war would go first, but then... Seven priests with ram's horns, they followed with the Ark of the Covenant, and then bringing up what is called in the King James the re-reward, which means the rear guard, was the children of Israel coming up behind. They all had to march around the city one time a day for six days, then seven times on the seventh day, and shout at the last trump. Now, I know you missed that doctrinal reference to the rapture, so let me just move on. Because the rapture of the church is so strange, a doctrine that a lot of preachers today do not believe what the Bible teaches about it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. To make it even more interesting, Joshua did not tell the people how many times they had to encircle the city or just what was going to happen at the end of their seven-day march. In the same way, Jesus, our Joshua, has not told us how long, he's just told us what direction. And this is our second point for study. God's people are given instructions one day at a time and then told to return to camp. And I hope you get that before you go because a whole lot of Christians that I know, they keep praying, God, show me your plan. And yet they're not following God's will. Hello, somebody. Hello. Hebrews 11.30 says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after. Let the whole church say after after they were compassed about seven days. So there's, there's no need to show you the plan if you can't take a step. If you can't take a step of faith, why should God show you the plan? If you cannot trust God with the step, knowing the plan isn't going to make any difference. So, so the only specific order Joshua relays to the people is down in verse 10. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. Now, I know this was not a Baptist bunch. I know it might have been Presbyterian or Methodist or Lutheran, I don't know. But I know they weren't Baptists. You say, Alan, how do you know that? Because not only were they expected to follow specific and strange orders, 
they had to do it in silence. That meant no murmuring, no complaining, no judging the pastor, no second guessing God. Well, why silence, Alan? Because all it would take to grieve the Holy Ghost is one person to complain, murmur, and grumble. Complaint, murmur, and grumbling are spiritual, spiritual viruses that always spread to others. So all, all it would have taken is one person walking around the wall saying, this is silly. Did we vote on this? My corns are hurting. I mean, somebody should have told me not to wear stilettos today. Nothing except following God's orders one day at a time. Those were God's orders. Though strange, they were specific. They were expected to be followed if they wanted to experience victory. How many times do we read God's word and yet not receive God's word? Because we conclude either God did not mean what he said, or God can do better than what he said, or there must be more to what he said. Hello, Adam Hamilton. See, I'm, I, you know, I am reminded, God's ways are not our ways, even if you are a sophisticated, megachurch pastor. Because, you know what, if you think you can explain God, God ain't in it. If you can explain God, or in this case, as he does, explain away God's word, then you must think you are God. Now that scares me. Because God has his own schedule, his own standard, and his own system. And God does not need your help, my help, anybody else's help. And he definitely does not seek your permission, need your validation, or look for your affirmation. God is God all by himself. So although the children of Israel were probably stunned at these specific and strange orders, they knew God wasn't playing. Because God wasn't asking their consideration. He was asking their cooperation. Watch, verse 13. And seven priests bearing seven trumpets or ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the re-reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp. So they did, six days. Though they may not have understood what God said, they stood on what God said and they obeyed it. Now let me open a window on that word because in 1866 when evangelist D.L. Moody was conducting a, a series of evangelistic meetings in Brockton, Massachusetts, there was a guy named Daniel B. Towner who was the director of the music department for Moody Bible Institute and he led music at those meetings and a young man rose up to give his testimony about how he had trusted Christ as a result of Moody's preaching, and he said, I'm going to trust, and I'm going to obey. And Towner was so touched by that, he jotted those words down. He sent them to Reverend J.H. Samus, a Presbyterian minister and, and teacher at Moody Bible Institute. And Reverend Samus expanded those words into the stanza and the chorus that we sing today. When, you, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Every Christian in the house has a Jericho to conquer, but also a Canaan to claim. We all have strongholds that keep us from following God's eternal purpose. It may be the wall of some habit you can't kick, or the wall of some unforgiveness, or bitterness, or pride, pride of race, pride of face, pride of place. Whatever the case, only the Lord Jesus can free you from that slavery, but in order to do that, you've got to come to the cross and die. It will be an order you did not expect and you do not yet understand, but if you want to claim Canaan and be happy in Jesus, you better trust and obey. Because in the final analysis, this is number three, you have to respect the opportunity you will find. See, they discovered an opportunity because obedience and opportunity are spiritually linked. Hello, somebody. Okay, let me be kind and rewind because you missed that. If you want God to give you an opportunity, it comes through your obedience to him. Because God will only give you a strategy based on your submission. 
Now turn, turn to Hebrews 11 again. Let me borrow the screen of your anointed imagination. Children of Israel finally crossed the Jordan River on their way to the land God promised to them 470 years before. They come to the other side of the Jordan only to be, be, be staring at the fortified city of Jericho, humanly impossible to conquer. God visits Joshua, gives him specific and strange orders to follow. In warfare, they were not to use carnal, fleshly weapons like guns or swords or tanks or missiles or drones, but only ram's horns and have their feet shod with a good pair of gospel shoes. So they followed God's orders. They found a great, grand, and glorious opportunity, and it included three things. And this is why we are at Joshua today. This is where God has led us to as a church. These are the three things we find. First, the opportunity to deliver God's person. Here in Joshua 6, look down at verse 17. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. Uh, okay, they, they'll be accursed to the Lord only. Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Now we browsed through Rahab's biography when we had the marriage conference back in March. So I'm not going to go through all that, but if you'll look at Hebrews 11, verse 31, it tells us, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not. She perished not with those who believed not. When? Let the whole church say when. When she had received the spies with peace. See, she was the woman who had enough faith to risk her life for the life of those spies. And in process of assisting those spies, she accepted Israel's Savior. She turned from the idols of her people and she turned to the God of Israel. And as a result, she was given a type, a token, a sign. She was given a new identity in the form of a scarlet thread that said she and her family... Whoever trusted in the word of the gospel she was giving to them, and they came into her house and her home at that time, they would all be saved from judgment. So first, there's an opportunity to deliver all the people God claims for himself in this city. Starting with all the people God claims for himself in this service, if you need to get saved, spreading to all the people God claims for himself in the media community. But really, we're not a Blue Springs church, we're a city church. So we want to claim all the people God has for himself in this city and abroad. And I don't even know how to convey that. But that's where we're at as a church. But second, we've got another opportunity because we have the opportunity to bring deliverance by God's pardon. Verse 22. But Joshua said unto the two men that spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren, all that she had, and they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel, outside of the camp, and they burnt the city with fire, and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved... Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Joshua comes in to conquer the city of Jericho, and he remembers Rahab, and he sets forth God's pardon of Rahab by delivering her and her family. Because you do know that when we watch people get saved and then we tell them the next step is discipleship, we see marriages put back together. We see families put together. It's not, it's not something that's just good for them. It starts putting together all of their relationships. That's why as guys, as men, we need to be here Thursday night for our small group centered around that kingdom man study because we need that type of community together. That's why we're doing our... Our Bible camp, our, our, our summer, summer camp together the way that we're doing. Because if you want community, come out to that. Because the only way to make it work is to, is to, throw, is to do a throwback. It, it, it won't, it, it'll be a throwback Thursday, but it'll be a throwback Wednesday, throwback Thursday, throwback Friday, throwback Saturday. 
because we got to put all the men and boys in rooms together. We've got to put all the ladies and girls in rooms together in order to maximize the rooms that we've got and be able to get 250 people out there. That is community. Okay, but we've got to have those type of times together and we've got to do those type of things together because we have an opportunity not just to get people the gospel and see them one to Christ, but to get them discipled and see them grow in their walk with the Lord. What a testimony to the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, the amazing redemption of God. Because watch, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Why? Because it has this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And sadly, there are many churches, denominations, and, and preachers today who, because they do not rightly divide and interpret and apply the scriptures, they think and they try and make others believe that it is possible for a born-again person to lose their salvation. But your eternal security is not based on you holding on to God. It's based on God holding on to you. Since there is nothing you could do to earn it, there's nothing you can do to keep it. And that means there's nothing you can do to lose it because it is a gift of grace based on faith in the finished work of Christ. Now, you may be unsaved before you get born again. But there's, there's nobody who can be unborn once they get saved. That's what I'm talking about. Rahab lived in a, in a city awaiting destruction, but because she put her faith in God, God remembered and raptured her. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life, God will remember you just like he remembered Rahab. He will not flee, he will not forget, and he will not forsake you. Because God cannot fail you. And that, that's, that, that is so that in the final analysis, and this is letter C, we have the opportunity to demonstrate God's power. By faith, Joshua led the children of Israel to do something they'd never done in order to see something they'd never seen. They heard the inaudible, saw the invisible, so they could do the impossible. Watch, verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city. Every man strayed before him, and they took the city. Now, I knew I was preaching here today, and, you know, every Sunday we have visitors, and and I knew we'd have special visitors with us this morning. And, and you all are sophisticated, cultivated, educated crowd. So I knew I couldn't be no lazy preacher. I'd have to go home and do my homework. So I performed an etymological investigation of that Hebrew word translated flat in verse 20. And you know, I discovered it literally means underneath or below. It means the walls gave way. There was a total collapse from their foundation up. It was a total devastation of the walls for a complete destruction of Jericho. That is how God conquers your addiction. That is how God will release you from slavery. It is only after you come under bondage to the Lord Jesus Christ. The only thing you have to do is climb up the dust and debris left over after the demonstration of God's power. Now turn to Psalm 34, because the last thing that we learn is you've got to shout on the front side. Anybody can shout after the walls come tumbling down. But this is not about where you're going. This is about what God is doing. They were following the word of the Lord, and when you follow the word of the Lord, praise is the nuclear option. They may be looking at you, teasing you, talking about you behind your back, but worship, the worship shout of praise is always... The nuclear option. People look, will look at you think you're crazy. But praise is the nuclear option because praise on the front end says, God, I know you're real. God, I know you hear my prayer. And when you get it before you give it, when, when, you, when you get the praise out there before God has given you everything he has for you, praise says, God, I know you're reliable. That's why David said before Abimelech in Psalm 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times without ceasing continually. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian, please pray. Do you have walls that need to come down? 
Do you have any Jerichos that keep you from enjoying and experiencing and entering the eternal purpose of God and the abundant Christian life that God has promised to you? Jericho fell flat as a result of the shouts and the trumpets of praise. And 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. See, see, Joshua did it that way because Jesus is going to do it this way. He descends with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And you know what happens then? He starts from the bottom up. He starts beneath. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. One day every Jericho will fall at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And yet, you know what? The one who will bring down the walls one day is the same one who can bring down your wall today. The only question now is, will you let him? Will you let him? Go ahead and stand and grab your neighbor by the hand. Our road to Canaan is lined with many obstacles we cannot move, with many afflictions we can we can never endure by ourselves. But if you're not saved this morning, you need to come to the cross today and you need to let Jesus do what you cannot do. And you know, most Sundays I ask you if you're in, in here and you want to get saved to raise your hand and let me pray for you. I want you to know if you've done that any of the last few weeks, don't stop there. The next thing you need to do when you exit today is turn right to our discipleship table and, and tell them you did that so that you can take the next step of discipleship. Because that's what it means to come under bondage to the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that He heard you, you answered, but you didn't stop there. You were willing to obey. You were willing to submit. You were willing to die. Nobody gets saved by raising their hand. You get saved because if you raised your hand and I prayed for you, what you were saying was you wanted to exchange places with Christ. You were willing to give up your sinful, rotten life in order to get his righteous, spotless life. You have to come to the cross and die in order to get his life. Come to the cross today. Let the Lord Jesus do what you cannot do so that you can get the things you cannot get and find in him your only Savior. So as soon as I get done praying, just come here to the front. If you have any need of spiritual assistance at all, let us have a word of prayer with you. Let us show you things from the Bible. Father, I thank you today for the time you've given us in your house. God, I thank you for the journey that you put us on in this book of Joshua. I thank you for the, for the specific pathway that you've led us along in order to get us here. And God, we've got to trust you have the whole future providentially mapped out. Just like, just like you've had the past. Nobody is here today on accident. Everyone is here by divine appointment. And God, we ask that you would speak to them. We pray that you would do in our hearts and our lives what you did in the heart of Rahab. No matter how she viewed herself, no matter how she felt about herself, she was willing to trust in the God of those two Israelite men. She was willing to turn to the living God of Israel and put her faith in him. And Lord, we want people to do that today. Lord, we want to help them do that. Give them the courage to come forward at the end. Father, we thank you for this time. Be with us this week, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.